Hello, everyone. We are going to continue our discussion of national income by moving on to the goods market. Now, we've already talked about in lectures two and three the supply side of the economy. So we determined in, this, in lecture two how much we were going to produce. In lecture three, who's going to get what? All right, who's going to get the income from the production of those goods, the sale of those produ uh, the production of those goods. Now we're going to see, well, who's going to buy the stuff that we produce? So that's really what the goods market's all about. It's figuring out who wants to buy the stuff that we make. So the first thing you're going to know is we're going to make a big simplifying assumption. This is a closed economy. All right, a closed economy. And what does that mean? There's no net exports. So the components of aggregate demand are consumption, the amount of um, goods and services consumers demand for final use, investment, the amount of goods and services that businesses demand in order to produce other stuff, and G, which is government spending, so it's the amount of goods and services that the government demands in order to provide, well, whatever it is that the government provides, you know, governance. So we're going to begin with consumption. Now, the first thing you're going to notice about all of this is that the function we use to describe consumption or the demand for consumption or consumption function is going to be much, much simpler than what we dealt with in Chapter 2. In Chapter 2, we dove into this intertemporal choice model and tried to deal with the fact that, well, agents look forward in time and they want to plan for the future and they want to smooth their consumption out. So early in life, maybe when their income is low, they might borrow. And later in life, they might pay that back. And then finally, they save until they retire. Okay, They want to smooth their consumption. Well, we're not going to worry about that in this chapter. We're going to assume that consumption depends entirely on contemporaneous disposable income. Now, what in the world do I mean by contemporaneous disposable income. Well, first of all, disposable income is simply income minus taxes. The reason why we subtract taxes off is you don't get to spend your taxes. That gets taken out of your paycheck before you even get to it. So it's not at your disposal. So we only care about that those funds that the consumer actually has the option to use. So it's income minus taxes. And then I, I tack on this word contemporaneous. Well, what I mean by that is the current period, right now. So this, this consumer only cares about today. They only care about the present. They don't care about the future at all. They don't think about the future. The only thing that goes into their decision-making process is their current or contemporaneous disposable income. So if we move on, we just, we're going to make uh, some notation to discuss what the consumption function is. And I want you to notice, first of all, when I write out this consumption function, uh, this notation is a bit confusing. Okay, the notation is a bit confusing because we've got C equals C times Y minus T. And, well, that's not what we mean at all. All right, we mean that consumption, big C, the quantity of consumer goods demanded by consumers, is equal to a function of disposable income. So this C, the C on the left hand side of that equation that I boxed in is total quantity of consumption or consumer goods that are demanded. The right hand side of that is a function. So that C is actually a function. So you could think of it like this. Um, instead of C of that, you could think of it, you know, like if this were a math class, this funky script F of Y minus T. The only problem is we use that letter F to, to work with and, and think about the production function. So, well, that would be confusing too. So we're stuck with this C, which is a function of disposable income. Now, the next thing that we need to look at is as your disposable income goes up, so I'm going to write this here, disposable income goes up, what happens? Well your consumption goes up. And if you think about it, that makes sense. What would happen if you got, um, suddenly your boss came in, gave you a raise, said, I'm going to double your salary. And so your disposable income goes up by, say, 
Okay, well, your disposable income goes up, and what are you going to do? Well, you're going to consume more. I mean, think about it. What do most college students do when they graduate and they get their first job? They go out and they get rid of the college car, the college car that they love. They've, they'll have fond memories of, and that's the best part about it, the memory of it, right? Because it doesn't really run very well. It's got holes in the floor, and, well, you know, it's just, it's worn out. And so you want a good, reliable car. And so what do you do? You go buy a car. Well, all of a sudden, boom, your consumption went way up, right? Because you just bought a car. I mean, you were driving around a $50 beater, and now you've got, you know, say a $10,000, you know, really cool car. Well, your consumption went up. Why? Because your disposable income went up because now you've got, you know, your first real job after college. Uh, so that makes perfect sense. Well, let's think about this just a little bit farther then. Um, excuse me. If Y goes up, what'll happen? Then disposable income goes up, right? And then, therefore, consumption goes up. What happens if taxes go up? Well, if taxes go up, well, look, we're subtracting taxes off, so that means disposable income will go down, which means what? Consumption will go down. So all of a sudden now we can deal with the effects of increases on income, so business cycle fluctuations on consumption, and we can look at you know fiscal policy um, questions. What happens when we change taxes? What effect does that have on consumption? So our next thing is we want to define something called the marginal propensity to consume. All right, now this is probably something you remember from principles of macro or principles of microeconomics where the marginal propensity to consume is simply how much does consumption go up when income goes up by one dollar? What is the increase in consumption when disposable income increases by one dollar? That's the question. So how can disposable income increase by a dollar? Well either income goes up by a dollar, either Y goes up by a dollar, or taxes go down by one dollar. Either way we're going to increase consumption or the disposable income by one dollar. Now, how much of that will get spent on consumption by the consumer? Well, however much they decide not to save. So marginal propensity to consume is the percentage of the next dollar that they will spend. Marginal propensity to save would be the amount of the next dollar that they save. So here's our basic consumption function, and we have some parts to this consumption function. So let me go ahead and draw those parts out. The first thing that we want to look at is the slope of the consumption function. And the slope of the consumption function turns out to be the marginal propensity, marginal propensity to consume. Okay, why is that? Well, if I increase disposable income by $1, so that would be my run. How much is consumption going to go up by? Marginal propensity to consume, that's my rise. One other part that we have here, if we look down here, we have an intercept. Notice that when income is zero, consumption is not zero. Right? Because there's exactly one class of people who consume nothing. What are those? Uh, those are dead people, right? And, well, if you think about it, if if in River Falls you go to Cemetery Road and you drive down Cemetery Road, and if you're going um, towards, well, I don't know how which direction you're going, but if you look the one direction, you see it's called Cemetery Road because there's a cemetery beside it. And, well, what kind of people inhabit a cemetery? Well, uh, dead people. And um, are those dead people consuming anything? Well, actually, yeah, they are. They're consuming a cemetery plot. So now we even have a class of dead people who are consuming. And clearly a dead person's income is zero because, well, you know, dead people don't make money. And, well, all of a sudden, boom, we see that it's probably not a good assumption to assume we're going to have zero consumption, even if we have zero income. So we have this part here that we call autonomous consumption. Okay, autonomous consumption. That's the minimum level or subsistence level of consumption needed to sustain life. So, moving on. Okay, we've got the consumption function settled. Now we need to talk about the investment function. Now, in our model, you'll notice something that's, well, a little bit, a little bit funny. First of all, the consumption function, notice, 
if you look at this, you notice one thing that's missing. You know, there's no R. There's no interest rate, right? So we've assumed away the consumer is going to be borrowing. Why? Because the consumer only cares about contemporaneous income. And if they're only caring about contemporaneous income, they're not worried about borrowing in, or lending in the future. That we're, we're just simplifying that away. Now, could we add that in? Yes. Should we add that in? Most definitely. Um, do we need to for right now? No, nah, let's just let's let's crawl before we run. But if you want to make this a richer, more realistic model, it would be very good to add an interest rate in as part of the um, consumption function, an argument of the consumption function. Likewise, we're going to talk about the investment function. And we're going to say the investment function is solely a function of interest rates. Now, is that a good assumption? Could it be the function of something else? Yes, it probably is a function of income. It probably is a function of taxes. There's probably, you know, regulation. I mean, there's a whole host of things that could be a part of this investment function and probably are a part of this investment function. But for right now, we're going to keep things simple. You know, we're going to crawl before we run um, and realize that, hey, if you want to do a, a senior um, project, or an honors project or a research project, hey, this is one thing you could do. You could expand this investment function to something a little more realistic. But for right now, we're going to stick with what we have. And note, the model that we end up with actually has pretty good predictions over what really happens. So even though we make these simplifying assumptions that may or may not be good assumptions, it still seems to work pretty well. OK, so the investment function is a function of R. R is the real interest rate, or the nominal interest rate corrected for inflation. Now remember, we have this thing called the Fisher equation. And if you want to, I think I've mentioned this in passing a couple times. If you really want to know more about the Fisher equation, take money in banking, and I develop the whole thing. I show you how to derive it. It's all really cool. But for right now, uh, the Fisher equation simply says that the real interest rate equals, well, actually, it approximately equals the nominal interest rate minus inflation. And technically, it's expected inflation. But usually, we just put in actual inflation, assuming that we have really, really good expectations. OK, so we have an investment function. It's a function of the real interest rate. Now, the question is, is it upward sloping or downward sloping? Well, I'm going to say it's downward sloping. And here's why. When the real interest rate goes up, what does that mean? That'll increase our cost of borrowing. And overall, if we remember going back to chapter two when we talked about the investment function, what it does is it increases the cost of ownership of capital. And when it increases the cost without any increase in benefit, what happens? Well, we want less of something. So that's exactly what we would expect to have happen. Interest rates go up. What happens? Our demand for investment goes down. Now remember, this is probably a little confusing because I'm using the word investment. And you think, well, wait a minute. Interest rates go up. That means I get a bigger return on my investment. And so I, I want more of that investment. Well, but the problem with that is you're defining investment in kind of the vernacular terms of investment, not the way we do so in econ economics. Remember, in economics, investment is businesses buying goods that they use to make other goods. Okay, not buying stocks or bonds or whatever. It's buying the stuff, the tools that businesses use to make stuff. And so if the interest rate goes up, that's actually going to lower my return on my investment. Okay, even though it sounds a little funny, it's because we use that term a little bit weird. And in our defense, we've been using that term weird for longer than, well, most everybody else has been using the word the way they use it. Finally, government spending. So we're going to make some really cool assumptions about government spending. First of all, that it's exogenous. So we're going to take G as given and T as given. They're exogenous. We're not going to try to determine them within the model. I usually make the joke that, well, the reason why we ex assume that the government's behavior is exogenous is because we in economics can only um, model rational behavior. Well, okay, so that's kind of a silly joke. But in any event, 
Um, government spending, uh, this is simply government spending on goods and services. This definitely excludes transfer payments. Now, why does it include, exclude transfer payments? Because transfer payments are not the purchase of a good or service. They're transferring funds from one entity, in this case the government, to another entity. For example, Social Security benefits. It would be transferred from the government to um, an individual. Now, why don't we count that? Well, simple. That individual gets those benefits. They get that money. Then they spend it. And we count that spending there. And if we counted the transfer payment of the government, we'd end up double counting that money. All right, so those funds. So we exclude transfer payments, and we take government spending and government and taxation as exogenous. Oh, and by the way, just so I, I make, sh make clear, sorry about this, we have two types of variables in any model. Endogenous variables, that's E-N-D-O, Genus, right? Indo means within or inside, so that means a variable that's determined um, inside the model. Exogenous, exo, exit, outside, means it's determined outside the model. So endogenous variables inside the model, exogenous variables outside the model. So aggregate demand is, well, C plus I plus G. In this case, C plus I plus G, because there's no foreign sector, we're a closed economy, there's no net exports. So we just simply have C plus I plus G. And notice a few things. First of all, aggregate income, all right, this Y is fixed. Because why? Technology is fixed, capital is fixed, labor is fixed. So guess what? This, T, this Y right up here, that's fixed, because, well, we know what it is, right? And Taxes are fixed. Why? Because they're determined exogenously. We just take those as a constant. Oh, and government spending is fixed. So, well, we know, because we know that's a constant. And the only one we have left to be variable is investment. So the only thing changing in this model is going to be investment. Now, we've got our aggregate supply function right here. We, we talked about that in um, lectures two and three. So in equilibrium, what do we have? Well, y equals c plus i plus g. And remember, all the way back at the beginning when we have our national income accounting identity, y, which is real GDP, equals c plus i plus g plus net exports. And in this case, we're a closed economy, so net exports are 0 because there are no net exports. And so we have y equals c plus i plus g. Easy peasy. So the real interest rate is what adjusts to make sure these two guys are in equilibrium. And that concludes our lecture four talking about the goods market within chapter three discussing national income.